Ashki Igo Hati Hatsu Shuna Le Nika Lishkishka No Le There's a lot of hurt and strong feelings that went with that especially some of the stories that we got told and then you read it in the history books and, and what they have told you is a whole lot different from what you hear in the history books. It's just like the history books went back and just wrote down, the white people just wrote, wrote down what they wanted to write down. They didn't write down what was really told to them. See, that's what I'm saying. See, they, they, they used education to get rid of language, see. See, my dad, when he went to school, he, he wouldn't, they wouldn't allow him to speak Cherokee in the schoolroom, in class. You see, they was against the rule, my dad said. That the, the effects still exist. Uh, any animosity that, that still exists amongst the tribe, uh, be it Eastern Band or Cherokee Nation, the, the roots of that animosity can be traced back to removal and to that time period, uh, 1819 to 1835. Well, to the Cherokee people today, to the big majority, uh, I think, uh, I don't, I think there's just a very few people that really, really realize the suffering that uh, our grandmas and grandmas suffered. I think uh, a lot of us, we get up in the morning and we get dressed and we get ready to go to work and we never think of these things, you know, back. We, uh, it's like thinking of uh, our Christ was the same way. And uh, we don't think about Christ a lot of times when we get up in the morning. We just think, oh, it's a gloomy day and, you know, we have all these complaints. But um, every day and every moment of our lives, I think we should give thanks and thanks to our grandpas and grandmas who had such courage with the help of uh, our Creator, of course, you know, to, for all these things to happen. There's a guy who was building a log house. Back then, all the things that we had was heat, was a chimney. There was no uh, such a thing that uh, wood heater and all that stuff we got nowadays. He's building it. They used to get mud in all places. I don't know what kind of mud, mud they used, you know, to tie, daub it up between rocks. He was doing that. Okay, the white man stand there. Every time he put mud on it, there's some sh shiny stuff mixed with it. This man standing there looking at it while the guy there, man, or oh, yeah, Indian wood doing, fixing it, putting mud on it. Some places be good size shiny thing in it. So I went on. Then finally, he decided he's going to come back again. Won't know what it was mixed with that, but he just about had figured out what it was. So what he was putting the mud in that between the rocks, keep from the uh, uh, air going through or leak. So he figured out. See, there was gold mixed in that mud. Some pretty good size. This Indian didn't know what it was, so I just kept working on it. So that's what started it. That's what the most of what they said was a gold. They want it to get us out of here so they can have it. So that's where we wind up. They got the goodies and we got the rough end of it. Many of the people who had to go they they had they were not resistive. Uh, they they had finally concluded that yes, we're going to move. And uh, again, the only thing they were afraid of is that they were going to be separated, split their families up. This was the main thing that they were frightened about. And some of them did get separated during during their movements. And, and uh, many of them died. Families were died. Some families were devastated. The whole families died during during removal. They weren't equipped. They probably in poor health, and uh, that that was uh, 
the, 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 the bad things, especially when they were waiting to cross rivers and they were in certain places that sanitation had, was terrible and, and many people died waiting, waiting around and, and freezing to death. Uh, I felt like it was just all for, I guess, the want for gold, whatever. And then I felt like the President of the United States at that time really, I guess, he uh, said, betrayed us, you know. And I, felt, and I didn't find out he was a Democrat until later on. But, uh, Let's just say that if I receive a $20 bill, I get rid of it right quick because of the man that's on it, you know. Because I don't think he's worthy to be put on a $20 bill to have the trust of the Indians and then him turn around and stab him in the back and the way he deceived them. Yeah, I was working once with a group of students and I uh, think they were from Cincinnati and I told the students all about Andrew Jackson one night. They said they'd come and uh, work on the reservation for us if I would give them some Cherokee history. So I gave them the history of Andrew Jackson and uh, pretty well laid it out there the way it should have been. And the next day we came to Cherokee to do some work. We were working in a cornfield of an elderly Cherokee woman planting her corn. I think this was probably in late May. And we were out there working and I noticed a young lady who was reluctant to stop working. And we had a break about 10 o'clock and everyone was hot and sweaty. And so we looked out and she was still working. I went out and asked her if she had something to drink and she was rather short with me and told me yes, that she was fine. And so I left her out there. And then again, I looked back at lunchtime, the others had taken a break and she was still working. And so again, I went out and told her that uh, she needed to take a break and she was a little upset and uh, just refused to, to do that. And I wondered why. And um, she just basically told me that um, she was upset because Andrew Jackson was her great, great grandfather and she felt so terrible about the things that he would done, had done. And um, so there was a little lady we were working for. She was a full-blood Cherokee, and she came down wondering what was going on because the young lady was crying. And so she talked to her, and she, she, she said, my name is Joey Jackson, and my great-great-grandfather was Andrew Jackson, and I hate the things that he did. And so the Cherokee woman looked at her and says, you are not Andrew Jackson. She said, look in this group, look out in that field, do you see Drowning Bear or June Alaska? She said, we are people of today and we must take off our hats to the past and roll our sleeves up to the future. June Alaska was a, uh, a real, I like to think he was a warrior. First and foremost, he was a, he was a warrior and he led a group of, uh, of a hundred Cherokees from this region to fight with Andrew Jackson forces at the Horseshoe Bend. And uh, they walked all the way from this region down to Horseshoe Bend in Alabama, uh, which is just north of uh, Alexander, Tal near Talladega, somewhere in that region. So that's a, that's a pretty, pretty good ways by foot to go down there and, and fight a battle, come back. He joined up with 500 other Cherokees and some friendly Creeks. And uh, they sided with Andrew Jackson forces uh, fought against the Creek Indians at uh, the Tallapoosa River there at Horseshoe Bend. And uh, June Luska supposedly led an attack across, this, across the river in canoes that uh, created a diversionary action and uh, saved the day for Andrew Jackson forces. Which the reason the Cherokees had fought the Creeks was uh, they had been promised some land there was a land dispute going on between the Creeks and Cherokees. They had been some type of rival enemies. They, they weren't friendly to each other. And uh, Andrew Jackson had promised the Creeks, of, uh, the Cherokees, some of the Creek land that it would cede it back to the Cherokee Nation, which never materialized. Uh, many more promises it did to the Cherokees that were broken. So anyway, Andrew, ja uh, Andrew Jackson broke, broke his promise to the Cherokees. He did recognize Junaluska's bravery. Supposedly, he saved the life of Andrew Jackson at Horseshoe Bend when one of the uh, captives tried to uh, bro broke loose with a tomahawk and apparently had, had Andrew Jackson at bay and Junaluska supposedly intervened and, and actually killed the, uh, the Creek warrior. So 
that's the way the story goes. So uh, Juno Lasker came back, brought his warriors back. The uh, Cherokees had lost more people proportionately than the Tennessee militia and Andrew Jackson's army forces had in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Andrew Jackson was known as a, well, this was a battle that really made Andrew Jackson famous. So really the Cherokees were instrumental in making Andrew Jackson a famous, famous man. He went on from there to become the general of the army, I guess, at the time, went on to end, uh, New Orleans and and then later on become president of the United States. And as we know later, he turned his back against the Cherokees and moved them to Oklahoma. They had asked him, uh, there's a story that June Alaska had come back here and resided here uh, in, at his home and actually made a trip, I think, to uh, Washington and uh, uh, I talked with Andrew uh, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson refused him an audience at the time in Washington. He said his his uh, audience has, had finished. He he was not going to talk about not removing the Cherokee people, but that was the reason they had gone up there to discuss it with with Andrew Jackson, and he wouldn't talk to him about him. Jim Alaska came back here. Uh, he had sold some property in a previous uh, treaty over in Haywood County, what's well, Haywood County now. And some of his apple trees uh, were growing over on that Haywood County property. And we have some apple trees growing below the monument here that uh, the Jim Brown, Joe Brown, had. he actually donated those apples. And he went all the way back to the days of June Luska and got this, got this apple. And he has resurrected that apple tree. It's called the June Luska apple. So we have three June Luska apple trees growing below the monument here. And we let the, uh, the leadership committee called the uh, Juno Luska Leadership Group in Cherokee plant those trees uh, a couple of years ago. So hopefully we're going to see some Juno Luska apples growing here pretty soon. Well, Chacha was just the first name. I mean, the last, just one name. You know, now we have it as a last name. But uh, at one time it was just uh, one name, Juno Luska, Yonaguska, and all them. And that's where the families came in from. But Wachacha started on that Trail of Tears. Uh, I reckon back in 1834, and uh, him, I think somewhere down, uh, I forget where it was, but anyway, him and uh, June Lusk decided to gather up 50, 50, I guess, warriors or 50 people, and they decided to split them up in 25 people apiece, and they both took separate routes. Now, June Lusk and them got caught, but what Chacha did, they made it back to the mountains, I think back to the mountains of Snowbird because uh, that's where we originally dwell. And uh, at one time we had property way over in St. Antilla, you know, close to uh, Joyce Kilmer and them. So it was probably this whole area they probably came back to at that point. And I guess that's where the generations developed from, like I said, from a last name to, I mean, from a first name to a last name. June Luska lived and resided in uh across the hill over in Andrews, and during the removal period, he went down uh, to collect some money for the property that he had been, uh, been owed by the U.S. Army. And uh, they apprehended him at the time and said he was harboring fugitives. He was hiding them out in the hills. He claimed to be a citizen based upon the Treaty of uh, 1819, a citizen of North Carolina. And so, they said that uh, he was harboring fugitives, taking them food, so they arrested him and his brother, Wachacha, and uh, carted him off to prison. Well, they were brothers. And, um, well, they grew up together, and I don't know if they w both went to war together at Horseshoe, Battle of Creeks and stuff, but I think uh, where they were brothers and family, they probably grew up together all these years, you know. And, uh, like I said, I think they done that, you know, they probably did share a lot, like any other family does now, you know. And they actually had a, uh, had a hearing somewhere around Maryville, Tennessee, down near Vanor, somewhere in that area at the time. And uh, uh, the Army said the region is under martial law, that uh, the, they could do what they wanted to. June Luska was not, uh, allowed to return to his family. They, they had apprehended his wife 
and placed her in the, in the, in the uh, well, I like to call them uh, prison camps, but uh, they had established several camps throughout this region uh, during the removal period, and, and one of them was right here in, in present-day Robbinsville. It's called Fort Montgomery. And uh, then uh, at, uh, he, he later, after the removal, she died. Uh, his wife died in one of those, those camps while waiting for the removal to, uh, to Oklahoma. So uh, he waited around till the fall and actually departed the area in late, late early fall with the Jesse Bushyhead's detachment and they would move out in groups of uh, 1,000. There's 15 groups, 16 groups, and uh, they went down to the mouth of the, the Hiawassee River and the T Tennessee River where they converged. And uh, there was a place called the Bly's Ferry there, and that's where they all departed across the Tennessee River there. And many of them departed from that location to Oklahoma. And uh, he, he went with uh, Jesse Bussey head detachment. About three weeks or four weeks into the journey, he ran off with a group of, uh, of uh, about 25 warriors. Wachacha was younger than he was. He had him and Wachacha were brothers. And so Wachacha took a younger group of people with him, and their plan was to come back. They were three or four weeks into the journey get back into the Smokies, cross the Tennessee River, come back home. And so that's, that was their plan. June Leska had his old group with him, his old warriors with him. They were a little, had some age on them at that time. So they traveled slower and they got caught crossing the Tennessee River. And uh, Wachacha's group actually made it back into the Smokies come back into Snowbird and many of the descendants of today, of Maggie Wachacha's family and Abraham Wachacha, they're descendants of Wachacha's that made it back and still reside here in uh, the Snowbird community. Uh, Grandma Maggie, she'd tell me, you know, that at the time that they left, uh, I guess she heard the stories, the kids were crying, the women were crying, and it was just, just I guess they just got root, over, uprooted overnight. And it felt like, you know, I reckon when they left, they didn't say goodbye. You know, there's no goodbye word in Cherokee because they knew they'd be back, some of them, but some of them knew they won't. So, uh, they just, you know, I think at that point they were all sad, but they knew what had happened too. They knew that they'd been, I guess, sold out in a way, you know. After he was captured, story goes that he was put in chains. We don't know that for sure. And we don't know if he was put in chains and, and walked, but we think he might have been transported. But he was never, he, we think that he stayed in Oklahoma for two years, 18 months, and then he came back here. Uh, the word was he walked all the way back, him and a companion, they came back here. He wanted to take up residence in uh, his old homestead, come back here, it had already been taken up by white settlers. And he was convinced to come over here into this area and uh, one of the old legislatures was his friend, uh, uh, and he, he got him, uh, took a resolution down to the uh, legislature in Raleigh, North Carolina, and got, a, got the resolution passed authorizing him 337 acres of land, $100.